Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this um, EIP conference session on um, monitoring elections. We've got four papers in front of us at, this afternoon, which which promise to be uh, fascinating accounts of, of how we look and and take an overview of of election administration, election integrity. Um, I say good afternoon. I should say good morning. To some of you and and um, whatever the time of day some of the other, the rest of you are, are, are at. Um, anyhow, welcome. Um, what we're going to do is take the papers in order that they're on the program. So we'll we'll start with with Amber and colleagues talking about um, the UK general election 2019, followed by Anna um, and electoral observation the Brazilian case, um, competing verdicts. Daniela is going to talk about that. And followed by um, Lindsay and Stephanie, I am talking about volunteer election monitors. Um, we're going to take effectively um, 15 minutes for, for each paper. If any are shorter, that's fine. Afterwards, I'll um, provide uh, very quick comments on the three of the papers, and I think Marguerite will uh, providing comments for one of the other papers, and then we'll open it to um, the questions. What I'm going to do for the paper givers is just with a couple of minutes to go, I will make an announcement. You have a couple of minutes to go. So I'd appreciate if you could keep time as well. That will help everything run smoothly. Okay, without further ado, um, I hand over to Amber. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, I've been a little bit in and out all week, but it's been really interesting hearing everyone's papers so far. Um, as, as is the theme of this whole session, uh, I'm going to talk about research that I've been working on with um, Kate Domet, Andrew Barkley and Sam Power, who are all um, not here today, but we've been working together to look at how to monitor the role of technology companies and the influence industry, which I'll describe in a second, and how they work within elections. And we use the case study of the 2019 uh, UK general election. Um, my co-workers, co-writers on this piece are all academics, but I thought I would just uh, say that after my PhD, I then went on to work at Tactical Tech. So I'm doing this research from the perspective of an NGO and we have a project called the Influence Industry Project that we've been working on for the last four or five years. And we've been really driven by the question of, um, I mean, we actually started on it before the Cambridge Analytical scandal hit, like in a very hipster-like way. We started, we looked at this first, but it was then, it's really helped bring attention to the work we were doing um, to try and work out how and why some companies get a lot of, um, a lot of attention, like Cambridge Analytica and like Facebook, um, but also trying to examine um, how a lot of these companies, uh, there's a lot more companies and there's enough that we could call it an industry um, working in political communications and working during elections and what type of techniques and things they're doing that are beyond advertising. Um, also what other types of methods and tools they're doing, A-B testing or website design, anything that relates to digital or data-driven technologies and um, elections. I'm just noticing my internet's been ropey all day, so I'm gonna turn my video off while I'm talking. I hope that's all right. And you've got these beautiful slides that are, you can look at instead. Um, we, uh, with the part of that research um, as like an example, so um, I looked into, um, I tried to start looking at all the different, we work in partnerships at Tactical Tech, so working with people in lots of different countries. We started looking at public documents of companies, their websites, social media pages. Um, we also looked at technology blogs um, and technology awards. We worked with partners who did interviews with politicians themselves or with political groups and local candidates. Um, and from all of that, we found a list of at least, um, we have a list of 500 companies that we would say make up the influence industry. And that could be data brokers, digital consultants, digital campaigns and consultants or communication consultants or advertising firms um, or technology software firms. And we decided then to look at some of the 
um, available information from publicly accessible finance reporting systems. And at this point, I was starting to work with Kate Domit and also Sam Power, who's one of the writers who's looked a lot at the UK's um, Electoral Commission's database. So in the case of this research, we looked at what can we learn about the influence industry and all of these companies looking at specifically the UK Electoral Commission database. So it's a very, very basic uh, slide, but um, there's more in the paper. Um, if you, um, we looked at the method, the method we used was to look at all of the invoices that were submitted for the 2019 general election. So as a background, the Electoral Commission um, asks that all political parties during the election period, actually all political groups that are involved in election campaigning, submit um, all of their spending and if the cost was more than 200 pounds, which is not far off, 200 euros or 200 dollars, wherever you are now, because it's all it's all merging into one. Um, but that's uh, if it's over that amount, then they also have to submit an invoice. Um, we coded, we opened 13,000 invoices. The number is actually now higher because we have added some more data to it. Um, but we coded just over 13,000 invoices for this first phase. Um, by opening each invoice and looking at what was reported by the company that they worked on. And from this, we built a set of categories and we also could build like the amount of money spent on each category. So some of our findings, um, firstly, we, we developed a set of categories and our categories were advertising and press, campaign and material, campaign materials, which includes, um, design of yeah does that we anything that was about design and anything that was about printing leaflets or delivering leaflets um and i'll show some of the numbers for that in a second um campaign activity which was the smallest category which was for get out the vote or um fundraising um phone banking then production which was anything because there was quite a few that just very specifically referenced video production or photo production um, research, anything related to focus um, groups or polling, data and, infra data and infrastructure for anything related to customer relationship management systems or, um, yeah, some of them were just supporting with uh, providing data. Consultancy was a word we used. We actually, would I would say, got the most debate in our group. We also all double coded um, everything. And um, consultancy ended up being anything about strategy, management, um, direction of the whole project, um, things that were vague, but generally towards um, something a higher level, something related to strategic um, direction of the campaign. And then miscellaneous, which we put things that weren't so relevant for what we're looking at. So that's where transport, um, catering, um, I'm trying to think of some of the others, hotel, nights at hotels that we put in there. And then completely unclear was a code that we created for um, invoices that told us nothing, or some of them just didn't have an invoice, or some of them had a blank invoice, or some of them had an invoice, and I'll go more into this in the findings, some of them had an invoice that just didn't give us enough information. I put the electoral commission categories on this slide as well, and um, I'll actually go more into some of the more interesting parts of how those two correlate. Um, but just that quite a lot of them, yeah, a lot of them ended up cor correlating and some of them didn't at all. So I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, overall, our first finding is like, well, what can we say? What, what money is being spent on external suppliers? And um, what can the UK Electoral Commission's database and their invoices tell us about this? And the majority of spends were on campaign materials. This, if you, when you break it down, this was the majority of that money was on leafleting and um, leaflet printing and leaflet delivery, which for us was useful and interesting because we're pursuing this in the rise of digital campaigning consultants and by far the biggest industry that's still supporting or the biggest space that the industry still supports elections in the UK was in leaflet design, leaflet printing, leaflet delivery. Um, the second one was advertising and press, which was mm, like by far social media advertising. Um, and then a little bit online website advertising and some of it was adverts in, in newspapers. And then the next one down was completely unclear and then the rest um, gets smaller. 
one of the things we did then was to compare it with the electoral commission's categories and what we have on the top um i don't know what that side is top right uh is the advertising our advertising group and then mapped onto the electoral commissions and what we see here is there's a lot that's dark blue and that pretty much directly correlates with the advertising section of the electoral commissions so we could say that when people buy advertising they know what it is they code it and it's got a code already in the electoral commission because the electoral commission know what it is and it's all very clear on the other hand um if what we have on the bottom left is our data and infrastructure, which gets coded across advertising, market research, um, unsolicited materials to electors. Um, I can't remember if they already said it, market research, media, um, and overheads and general administration. So what we found just looking at the invoices that was quite clearly, okay, this relates to data, data infrastructure, um, digital infrastructure that the organizations need clearly doesn't have an equivalent in the um, Electoral Commission's database. And there's a few reflections from that. For example, the Electoral Commission's database is a bit of a mix of, and so were our categories actually, a little bit of a mix of um, what, what it is and what it's for. So advertising is a, is a category and that's kind of what it is. But then rallies and other events or manifesto and referendum material are both like what it's for. So there's a little bit of a mix of just like what the per how those categories have come about but we definitely felt like after doing this um new types of campaign support haven't quite got a category yet and and could it could really use with some relooking at some of the newer categories or adding categories that could support that um then the last one that i wanted to share from this part the findings that are the categories of reporting were um specifically consultancy um also because a lot of the, if just going back a couple, uh, there's hardly anything in data and infrastructure. Um, there's also not so much in consultancy, but we think a lot of the data and infrastructure side, which would be the digital campaigning and message testing is done either outside the election by internal party staff or by consultants. And so looking at consultancy, you can see that a lot of the people who were just listed as something that was like general strategy have been coded as the parties under the blue one, dark blue one, which is advertising, or the light blue one, which is overheads and general administration, and a little bit under the green for market research. So while we would have coded it as consultancy, this helps us see what consultants are actually supporting, what the concept of like a strategic consultant is supporting the um, political parties with. Our second half of our findings was about the actual utility of having invoices. And so one of the utilities is it helps us understand what the companies do. But then the second finding being there was a lot of invoices that just didn't give us information. I think under one, we, we had a few different criteria that we changed at different times, but under one, we would say 40% of invoices didn't, there was 40% of the lines didn't have a clear invoice. So that's yeah, roughly two and five or something like this, or just under two and five. Um, but then we took out the Conservative Party associations. I think it ended up being one in every 10 because the Conservative Party constituent associations were just one angle where every one of those doesn't require an invoice. So it could, so a lot of that money was just Conservative Party to other parts of the Conservative Party. They were the only party to do that. Um, otherwise, it was one in 10 pounds um was unclear and that could be for a few different reasons incorrect invoices for a couple um 10 percent was because it's under 200 pounds so they don't have to provide an invoice 17 percent was blank invoices which i would say were almost all applied camera um just every single one was blank so i i don't know if that's now being pursued or followed up I'm but going three, three minutes three minutes thanks great that's good to know um yeah, and so the biggest thing was about then is some had no invoices, some had unclear invoices, and there was a couple of different ways you, something could be unclear. So on one side, we have one that's completely censored, so that that invoice just tells us nothing. And on and it could be like a scanning problem. Some of them definitely felt like they had more like censored it. Some of it feels like a scanning issue. And on the other side, we had unclear like the Messina group, which we know from their website is a um, consultancy program or we just knew of them anyway but if you're just taking information only from their invoice all it has is consulting services 50 percent 
consultancy fee, 250,000. And we decided that while it was a consultant, it was also very clear that there's very little else that we could learn about what type of work they do or what they're doing. So we had a few that just said very, very little information. I really, this last section, I'm, which is good that it's at the end, because I've just put in a couple of comments or thoughts of where we're trying to go now or where we're going next with the paper. Recommendations that we're looking at for policymakers are updated categories, as I said, maybe standard invoices. They're both very only really relevant to systems that already have this, like the UK or the US who have reporting systems like this. Um, so we're looking at what, what recommendations we could say on a broader level or international level. And then some of the questions we want to ask is like, where does the responsibility lie for making this a transparent space? Is it with the companies? Is it with the political parties or with the Electoral Commission? And also, um, partly because we were just prompted to think about this very recently, like what, what is the point of it being public? Like, does this provide journalists work or does it also provide something for voters? And if so, what it is, but it feels like a whole new project if we want to look at that, but that's our current concluding question. Thank you. Right, thanks very much, Amber, for keeping to time some fascinating um, information in, in that um, presentation. Without um, further ado, we'll, we'll hand over to Anna, who's going to talk to us about um, election monitoring in Brazil. Anna. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning here in Brazil. Good afternoon, uh, uh, who are in, in, in Europe. Uh, it's a big pleasure for me to participate of this big event and uh, let me introduce myself firstly. I'm Ana Claudia Santano, a PhD in Constitutional International Law and also the general coordinator of an NGO called Transparência Eleitoral Brasil. Uh, we are the first NGO uh, which uh, managed the first electoral monitoring mission here, national uh, mission here in Brazil in 2020 elections. Uh, during the pandemic, actually, it was a huge challenge for us. So um, my work uh, is about this experience and I show to you a case study uh, to show uh, how electoral observation missions can benefit the electoral integrity of a country. So, um, Firstly, I would like to tell you uh, the title of my, I don't have a presentation, okay? I would like to, to, show, to, to show you the title of my paper, Restoring the Social Trust in the Electoral Process Through uh, Electoral Observation, the Brazilian Case. And since 2018, Brazil has been experiencing a period of deep social distrust in the electoral process specifically in the use of the electronic voting system. Our, our electronic voting system, we use it uh, uh, from 30 years ago. So there is a long time, we have a, tra a tradition of electronic voting system here. Although it has been adopted in, in 1996, due to a historic of electoral fraud, we have a huge historical fraud here in Brazil, the electronic ballot has been repeatedly questioned by President Bolsonaro and his cabinet, turning the debate into a, into a political flag and into a big wave of disinformation in his favor to undermine the Electoral Superior Court, uh, I will call it TSE, and the Electoral Justice uh, in the 2022 elections uh, in next October. The last electoral polls published concerning to the 2022 elections have pointed out his electoral defeat and that's why we believe that this, uh, that this speech uh, putting the distrust in the society about the, electro, uh, the electronic voting system is a political strategy. In a way to prevent some tragic events concerning the, the next elections resulting from this context, the TSE has actively proceeded to give public answers about the electronic voting system. This strategy includes many measures which combine institutional efforts and civil society participation as Transparency Electoral Brazil electoral uh, observation missions. One of these measures is the launch of the, the, this pilot project in 2020 elections. And uh, we also could introduce the, 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 a brand new uh, law landmark 
about the electoral, uh, the electoral observation here in our country. Well, um, before that, the Brazilian highest electoral authority somehow denied uh, the need for actions to reinforce the electronic voting system legitimacy, which somehow might have helped the extreme right wing groups to capture the real debate. For many years, Brazil has not considered electoral observation missions necessary to monitor elections in order to keep the levels of electoral integrity high. The situation has finally changed to allow this kind of missions, uh, domestic and international ones, during elections, which can generate data and reports to restore social trust. Well, uh, firstly, in the paper, uh, we describe how the first domestic uh, ele uh, electoral observation mission experience developed in the, in the impact of the final report on the rebuilding of social trust in the electoral process as a whole. The main question of our research is what benefits can electoral observation bring to the electoral integrity related to the social trust in electoral processes and results in countries with no electoral observation culture or background. This interrogation is important because of many years, for many years, several Latin American countries, such as Brazil, uh, contested the usefulness of the electoral observation missions to help, man to help maintain high or acceptable levels of electoral integrity, as it was already pointed out. This prideful position might have contributed to the current situation of vulnerability of electoral authorities in face of populist presidency's attacks, undermining the trust in democracy altogether, as it has been shown in 2021st uh, Latino Barometer. Okay, take this into account. Secondly, we use um, Pippa Norris and Ferran Martinez Icoma concept about electoral integrity. Uh, to say that the contribution of the electoral observation missions to identify good practices during electoral process uh, uh, can be very useful to our research. So our basis is uh, their concept. And for, uh, for, from this point, we use all the international laws concerning democracy and concerning uh, electoral integrity somehow. Uh, Article uh, 21st of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 25 of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights uh, uh, of the United Nations, and also Article 23 of the Inter-America Convention of Human Rights. We believe that this legal background can help us to reinforce the necessity of uh, the need of the electoral observation uh, to the to strengthen uh, Latin American democracies, and also I would like to point out um, the fact that uh, in all the Americas we have the high develop of the electoral observation practices, uh, not only because of the great work of the uh, organ. Uh, uh, um, the OAS, the Organizations of the Americans, um, because they have they have know how they already uh, they already uh, uh, realize a lot of electoral missions, and there there was one recommendation specifically to Brazil in the 2018 elections from OAS to uh, to to give a chance for somehow uh, electoral observation missions uh, from national NGOs. Well, considering this, I would like to describe how this experience in 2020 elections, local elections here in Brazil, uh, uh, happened. Uh, we had uh, uh, 53 uh, observers all over, uh, all over the country, five cities, five capitals, and including Brasilia, the capital of the country, and these five uh, capitals were distributed all over the country. So we, we were in the north, in northeast, in the southeast, and in the south. And also, um, there was a very deep context of uh, COVID-19. So it was very difficult to find observers and to reach somehow a, a landmark to protect ourselves. 
some of our team, uh, unfortunately, had to be excluded somehow of, of the voting day, of the observation of the voting day, because they were contaminated. They were sick. So um, uh, unfortunately, we had this kind of difficulties. But on the other hand, we had the many uh, 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 facilities. Uh, we have the deep collaboration, institutional collaboration of the TSE, which allow us to, uh, to bring all our knowledge and all uh, our, our intention to collaborate with the institutions through electoral observations. From that point, uh, we started a very, very proficient uh, dialogue with TSE for these elections, for these uh, uh, 2022 elections. Many measures were adopted uh, from that point. Uh, firstly, I would like to point out the, the, the um, installation of the, Transpar the Transparency Commission to inform society about the electronic voting system. This was an effort to, um, to battle, to, to battle uh, uh, against uh, all the attacks coming from um, the disinformation and uh, to the electoral authorities. We also collaborated to elaborate the first resolution. It's a kind of norm of the TSE regulating the electoral observing uh, missions. And we also could uh, have a, uh, uh, we, we also could have a conversation with the with the legislators about the new electoral code with a brand new articles uh, about electoral observations to not stay only with the electoral court, but also to dialogue with the National Congress. And we also participate as an NGO. Uh, we also participate in, in public hearings in National Congress about the new electoral vote uh, in, in this matter, or, or in the electoral uh, observation matter. And also in a huge discuss, uh, discussion that we had uh, uh, last year about um, uh, quoted the printed vote. The extreme right wing was demanding uh, the printed vote as a negative uh, speech against the electronic voting system. The electronic voting system right, right here in Brazil, uh, it has a, a series of uh, audit uh, methods, but uh, the extreme right groups were demanding much more. I could say the impossible audits. Uh, we, could, we, we couldn't manage this before the 2022 elections. But uh, I think that the, the most benefit from all of this experience was uh, a, a huge study of our, on our uh, contained in our uh, final report about the poll clerks, about gender, about uh, electoral sessions, uh, how the secrecy of voting was kept in the rooms, in the in the poll tables, and so on. The technology, the use of technology in elections, also uh, in the registration of candidates. Uh, we also could observe the violence in politics. Unfortunately, is uh, it's it's demanding much more research about it. And uh, three finally, minutes, please. Three minutes. Thank you. And we also could recommend many measures of transparency and good communication for the society. We believe that society has the right to know exactly how elections, how Brazilian elections is organizing. And we think that much step, many steps were, uh, were given in this, in, this, in this direction. So thank you so much for your attention. And I hope you can um, you can follow our work. I will just share uh, my screen uh, to give to you some uh, our social networks and our website to show our work. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. When the timing, Anna, many thanks. Um, once um, you, you take that off the screen, maybe you'd be so kind as to put that into the chat um, for people sure. who want to, to follow it. That, that would be, be fantastic. Um, Thank you. 
That would be fantastic. Thanks very much, Anna, for a, a fascinating presentation. Um, without further ado, uh, we move on to Daniela um, and colleagues who are going to talk to us about election monitors and post-election violence, where there are competing verdicts between election monitor groups. Daniela. Okay, thank you. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? It's a slide version like it was before. Yeah. So check to make sure that you can flip through. It's not full screen version? No. <laughs> Is it flipping at least? No. Okay, I don't know. I, I really don't know why this always happens to me. All right, let me try again. Okay. There you go. Great. Is it flipping? Yeah. Great. Okay. Yep, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, so this is research that's joint with um, three colleagues that are, um, well, two that are at the University of Pittsburgh, Borju Sabun and Parisa Davutoglu and Kelly Morrison, who's at the VDEM Institute. Um, and in this, in this project, we're gonna be uh, asking about the consequences of hosting multiple election monitors for post-election contention and violence. So let me start by just motivating a bit our research question, which is that, you know, something that I think we all kind of intuitively know, those of us that um, are following elections and election monitoring, is that it's very common nowadays for elections to host multiple different international election observation missions. Um, in fact, since 1990, more than 25% of executive elections have hosted multiple international monitoring missions but actually this has this has been increasing a lot over time so the 25% is is an average but if we start looking at what's been happening in the past 20 years um, by now you know in many countries more than half of the time elections uh, are hosting multiple different international monitoring groups it's also very common for there to be disagreement among these missions so according to our data that we've collected for this project we do see disagreement between different international groups in uh, about half the time, right? So in about 46% uh, percent of cases, when there was one monitor criticizing the election, there was another one that was issuing a more positive statement. Okay, so our, our question here really is, what are the consequences of having these competing verdicts? And by competing verdicts, we mean essentially when uh, more than one international election observation mission is issuing a, a, a statement or a conclusion about the election that are different, right? It could be, um, it, it could be, you know, very extreme difference, like full rejection or full approval, or more often it could be some more subtle disagreements between the observer groups. And how does this affect post-election mobilization um, and specifically violence. So when does, when does mobilization turn violent and what role do international election monitors play in these types of scenarios? Um, if, if we're thinking, for example, about uh, the 2019 election in Bolivia, this is just one instance, right, which, which got a lot of press attention in which um, criticism from international monitors did play a role in fomenting protests and ultimately violence. Existing research, um, there's a kind of a small uh, body of studies that does show and, and has studied empirically the effect of criticism by what what I'm going to loosely refer to as reputable observer missions, right? So these studies here by Dexeeker and Borzakowski and Hyde and Marinoff, they show that when you have reputable uh, international election observers and when they criticize the election, this is kind of a focal point for mobilization and it can also lead to violence. Um, but, you know, and here's where we come in with this project is that incumbents often also invite these less professional observer groups or newer observer groups that are not those that are typically considered to be the reputable ones by Western um, audiences. 
Okay, so this is really where we do have kind of a mismatch between what researchers have looked at so far, which has been focusing on a small number of like eight or 10 uh, international election um, missions uh, or organizations like the EU, the OAS, the United Nations. So most empirical research has focused on these groups. Um, but, you know, we don't have enough empirical research that's studying the effects of some of these newer um, international election observation missions. So in building our intuitions and our hypotheses, we, we start with a few premises. Um, first of all, we're, we're kind of starting from the premise that public beliefs about electoral quality shape post-election mobilization and they affect the risk of violence. So the link that we see, the link between election observers and mobilization runs through beliefs of the public about the quality and legitimacy of the election. Um, international election observers serve as a crucial source of information about election quality. It may not be the only source of information, but when they are present in an election, they do have this important informational role. Um, and also building from some recent research by Sarah Bush and Lauren Prather, um, we argue that in fact, we. We cannot assume that it's only the kind of Western, well-known international election monitors that are influencing beliefs. In fact, different audiences like domestic publics um, or different domestic elites, they may find other international election observers credible, and they may be shaped and influenced by alternative international election monitoring groups, which if you ask a Western kind of policymaker, uh, they may not perceive as being credible or professional, but these new groups may still influence beliefs of important audiences. Okay, so we kind of trace out two possible ways that competing verdicts among election observers might influence beliefs about election quality. The first possibility is that, you know, the, the relevant audiences, which include the domestic public, um, that they process information on a purely partisan basis, right? So if you have disagreement between election observers, basically each side is going to only um, be influenced by the information that supports your own prior partisan beliefs. Um, and in this type of situation, if you have two international groups that are disagreeing with each other, each kind of side in the partisan um, competition is going to be mobilized by the monitors that are agreeing with their own partisan beliefs. So in this scenario, we would expect disagreement between EOMs to actually increase post-election mobilization and violence, and it's going to be kind of a two-sided increase in mobilization. Alternatively, um, it may be that um, relevant domestic audiences um, follow something more of kind of a rational uh, updating model where they are influenced by not only the uh, monitor groups that share, that, that support their partisan side, but also by other groups. And in this situation, if you have disagreement between international election uh, monitors, you are going to see that to uh, lead to more uncertainty in the minds of the domestic public, right? Um, which is going to then kind of have the tendency to decrease um, mobilization and violence, okay? So compared, compared to a scenario where you have criticism by election monitors, if you have disagreement, there's going to be greater uncertainty about election quality and therefore less mobilization. Okay, so these are kind of the two, the two um, macro level scenarios that we're tracing out. The specific hypotheses then following these possible scenarios, first of all, we might expect competing verdicts among monitors to exacerbate or increase post-election violence compared to a scenario where you have um, what we call uncontested criticism by election monitors. 
Or alternatively, it may be that these competing verdicts among monitors is dampening post-election violence compared to a situation where you have just straight up criticism from international monitors. Okay, so we, in this project, we are planning to take a two-pronged approach to testing these intuitions. Um, what I'm going to do today is just show you quickly some preliminary cross-national evidence that we've been looking at, but we also plan to test uh, these hypotheses with micro-level evidence, um, probably running a survey experiment, um, but this micro-level element of the study is still in the work. So I'm just gonna present to you today some of the cross-national evidence that we've been gathering. Um, so we look at a sample, a global sample of non-OECD countries over about a 28 year period, looking only at executive elections, so presidential elections or in parliamentary systems, these would be legislative elections. Now for the results I'm gonna to present to you just today, um, we're looking at a, a specific indicator of post-election violence, which is the count of election-related fatalities using the DECO data set. But we also are in the process of analyzing a bunch of other outcome variables, including protests and mobilization um, and other forms of post-election contention. Okay, so the dependent here, variable here is just a count of the post-election related fatalities as a result of election violence. Um, the key explanatory variables are, uh, and I'll just highlight these two here. First of all, we have a variable that measures criticism of the election by any international election monitoring mission. And then on top of this, we have a second variable which, measure, which measures whether there is disagreement among two or more international monitoring groups, okay? And this data on uh, verdicts and criticism, it is original um, new data that I've collected with Julia Gray, which really is taking existing data sets on election monitoring, we're expanding it in time and scope. We're looking at a larger number of international groups um, over a longer period of time, and we're coding for whether they're present, which groups are present in the election, and also what did they say about the election in their statements after the election. I'd be happy to talk about the data a little bit more um, later. So let me just um, show you the key results here, um, and then I'll summarize things up for you. What we, what we find is pretty consistent evidence that when you have disagreement between different international election monitoring groups, That's this is actually, minutes, a, yeah, thank you. So the, when you have this disagreement, it's actually uh, robustly associated with less post-election violence. So we take this as support support uh, tentatively as support for the second scenario that I sketched out where when you are when you have multiple groups observing an election and if they're not agreeing with each other so one group is saying a, something positive and another group is saying something negative about the election it this is consistent with the idea that this creates uncertainty and it basically dampens the mobilizing potential of criticism from international election observers. So what's pretty interesting about these results is that if you look at just the variable for criticism, this is positively associated with violence. And this is actually consistent with what other research has found, right? But then when we add this new variable for disagreement, um, it's, it's having this dampening effect on violence, okay? And when we look at other outcome measures, which I won't present to you here, um, we see consistent effects, like where there is a significant <laughs> result, it's always in a negative direction. Um, obviously, there are a lot of issues here with endogeneity, you know, the, the treatment of the, the quote unquote treatment of uh, EOM disagreement is not randomly assigned. So we need to take a bunch of steps to try to address this, this question about kind of the direction of causality and endogeneity. 
Um, but so just summing up, basically we're seeing this preliminary evidence that competing verdicts among international groups seems to be associated with a reduction in post-election violence, um, specifically an election with uncontested criticism uh, sees about on average three election related fatalities, but this goes down to about zero when we have different international monitoring groups disagreeing about the quality of the election. Um, so just one, you know, in one, one last concluding point that I would make here in thinking about these findings is that it is actually consistent with the if we're thinking about governments and incumbents as being kind of rational actors this is very consistent with the idea that governments invite multiple international groups for precisely this reason actually to hedge against the risks of inviting in international groups that are going to criticize the conduct of your election and then create post-election mobilization, which is costly to the government, right? Assuming we're in a world where uh, a, a cheating and manipulation is you mostly coming from the government, what we find here is consistent, in, in perhaps in a sort of depressing way, it's kind of consistent with the idea that autocrats, for example, the strategy that autocrats uh, take of inviting in kind of autocratic election observers, that this is actually bearing fruit, that when you have um, different missions that are disagreeing with each other, it's, it's dampening, it's reducing post-election mobilization. Okay. On the other hand, maybe it's a good thing because we're reducing um, violence, right? So anyway, there's lots of interesting ways to think about these results. Um, I would be happy to talk, you know, more offline about um, the ideas that we have for micro level tests. We're thinking about doing um, a survey experiment. We can um, do that perhaps... in the discussion, Daniela. Thanks. We're out of yeah. time. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Um, right, thank you very much. Fascinating paper, some fascinating findings. Thanks, Daniela and team. Um, and now we hand to Lindsay, who's, who's going to take on and, and discuss um, issues around um, citizens' willingness to serve as, as volunteer election monitors. Um, Lindsay, over to you. Thank you. And um, thank you so much for having us here. I, I will turn the floor over initially to my co-author, Stephanie Singer, and we'll be co-presenting today. Hi, um, it is really a pleasure to be here. My background is, is not in uh, political science, but in uh, mathematics. And I have 15 years of very concrete experience on the ground with elections uh, uh, in various places in the United States, but primarily in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, so it's, it's uh, great to hear all of these presentations. Um, so, so um, in the United States, elections are decentralized, and so is election observation. It's very much a bottom-up exercise where it is uh, local party operatives and uh, candidate representatives who are doing the observing at the polling places. Um, and. Um, Part of my experience <clears throat> with elections is that there's there's a, a, almost no issue in elections that couldn't be uh, solved or at least substantially solved by more involvement by the citizenry in the election process. Uh, so um, I'm uh, highly motivated <laughs> in the United States to find ways to encourage uh, in particular, constructive election observation. Um, and that's the motivation that leads to our research question, which is uh, what factors predict willingness to volunteer to observe and what interventions increase interest in citizen volunteer uh, um, election observation. So um, in our uh, in our experiment, which Lindsay is going to describe in more detail, we use a document, a, a photograph of a document 
from an actual citizen self-organized election monitoring group uh, where in a recent election in the United States, one of the monitors reported on the form, the form is designed by this uh, self-formed group of citizens. And uh, one, of the, one of the observers reported finding uh, uh, about 700 more ballots than voters <laughs> uh, at, um, in a particular polling place. Um, so I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you. So we have just received our data recently and uh, we filed a pre-analysis plan and we're now going through to test some of our hypotheses. Since we have limited time, I'll focus on just a couple of the hypotheses. Um, okay, so in this paper, we are trying to explain what factors motivate citizens to be willing to serve as a volunteer organizer. So what what interventions might we imagine um, crafting that would um, make citizens be willing and engage them in this monitoring or observing process. Um, so our overall theoretical framework stems from social position theory and power relations theory. So we're really looking at groups in society and we're starting off with uh, the theoretical uh, assumption that institutions maintain power between groups. And so when groups have been marginalized historically from uh, the, the electoral process and, and in society, those groups will find the suggestion that there may have been irregularities or there may have been fraud. Groups that are marginalized will see be more likely to see these um, suggestions as being credible because every day they're living in um, a society in which they're facing structural racism. Um, and so a refinement, of course, of these uh, of power relations theory, intersectionality theory, the notion that groups uh, and, and structures are mutually constitutive. Um, and importantly, that when we look, for instance, as we do in this paper, at the intersection of a respondent's gender and uh, their race or ethnicity, um, that, um, for instance, men and women experience from different groups may experience privilege and marginalization differently. So Crenshaw, who is credited with developing institution or it, it, developing intersectional theory, says, well, we need to look at social groups intersectionally. And in order to understand how structures impact their marginalization and their experiences in the world and their political attitudes, we have to uh, basically empirically verify how they interact in the world. So H3 or hypothesis three that we are beginning to explore is the notion of winners and losers. We think that those who support the party that lost a recent election are more will be more likely to be interested in observing elections than those that were winners. So for instance, uh, we're in a, a world right now in the United States where we are constantly um, an issue that's very salient uh, is our last presidential election, uh, where many people believe that the results were not credible. Uh, and uh, I'm actually in Washington, D.C., in the very place where the insurrection uh, occurred. Um, and so we know that this is highly salient. So we think that maybe in this study, Democrats um because they're they they won the recent election they may be less interested in observing than republicans who may see the the suggestion of irregularities as being more credible all right so uh and then those who are from historically marginalized groups with regards to the electoral system will be more willing to serve, observe than those uh who are are from more privileged backgrounds Okay, so we designed this uh, survey experiment in order to be able to test uh, uh, the impact of uh, the group that lost um, to test how this shapes willingness to uh, engage as an observer. Um, and so we have three conditions in our Qualtrics survey. We have the control condition, the Republican loss condition, and the Democrat loss condition. So first we present the respondents with the, the picture that Stephanie described. Um, and then we describe that this form 
um, suggests that there were more uh, ballots than voters, and that suggests that something went wrong. The election was close, and a candidate lost by just a few votes. So that's the control. A candidate lost by just a few votes. The Republican lost ends in the election was close, and a Republican candidate lost by just a few votes, or a Democrat lost. Uh, by just a few votes. So everyone's primed to hear that maybe there was an irregularity, but there was a slightly different result in this election, which we didn't describe in great detail. It was a polling place. We ran a web-based Qualtrics survey, which we designed, uh, and we included 600 participants from all over the United States, almost every uh, US state. Although we didn't oversample non-white self-identifiers, we did have about 50-50 white-only self-identifiers and 50% um, multiracial or um, ethnic or racial minorities from power in the United States. And so our, we think our study is representative, or we hope that it's representative of the US overall. We have we followed the treatment with four in four dependent variables. Today we're going to talk about the one uh, that we're focusing on in our short presentation. Are you interested in election oversight? So we asked a question: Are you interested in learning more about how to observe? in an election as a citizen? Yes, no, maybe. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, a scale of zero to 100. So we have an, uh, we have actually a, a 100 point scale of interest. Um, so we have a number of independent variables, but one of them is sentiment uh, on a five point scale for the Democrat Party and the Republican Party. Uh, then we have uh, our categories of privilege and marginalization that intersect the race category and the gender category. And then we have a number of controls that include age, education, income, social capital, political participation, i.e. having voted or observed, and urban or rural residents. So first we can see that if we look at the black bars, this is the average interest in learning about how you could observe elections across the race categories. So you can see there's a significant difference with American Indian only selected being the most interested in learning how to observe, followed by multiple race categories selected, followed by Asian only, followed by white, Black and African American and Hispanic only. Um, I think it's interesting that the, the trust in elections was relatively low. Um, and there were a number of reasons in the open ended questions that were given. Uh, and the but the most trusting in a group, the group that's most trusting in elections is the Asian only category. Uh, well, the least is the uh, Native American only category. First, we ran some regressions, uh, just direct analysis. We did not find that this analysis was very helpful, but one of the uh, one of the variables that stood out was that those with higher education did state that they would be more interested in observing elections, while other categories, uh, especially uh, because there's sort of a there's some multicollinearity between being a Democrat and being a, 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 a Black American, for example, um, it was harder to get race or uh, Democratic sentiment to, to sort of come out in every regression. Um, in uh, just a few findings from our experiment, it was the case that as with many other experimental situations, we do not find significant results or significant effects of the treatment among women. So we have no significant, first of all, we have no um, homogenous uh, uh, differences across the groups, which we expected, but we also find no effect of the treatment among females. However, among males who are from historically marginalized groups uh, who experience um, racism and marginalization, we do find some significant results. And critically, what we find is that while we might expect those that are already privileged in a society to be 
interested in observing what we actually three find minutes, is Lindsay, three minutes. oh thank you is that among black democrat males and asian democrat males when they learn or when there's a suggestion that the democrat lost this uh this is the condition in which they are much more significantly more likely to want to observe okay so among groups that are historically marginalized hearing that their party that they're more likely to support has lost um, makes them more likely to say that they would want to uh, observe so this suggests that there may be untapped potential among marginalized groups who are already primed to understand the system needs to be held accountable however we don't know very much about what actually gets individuals from being interested in observing to the place where they can learn about elections and physically be present to observe, especially when uh, they're from a group that may be uh, may have less income in some cases. Um, what could be some of the economic incentives that could encourage volunteering? Uh, of course, this could include um, supporting with meals or transportation, so we need to know more and we would like to do another study uh, to look at varying the different incentives um, in order to come up with interventions or policies that could help mobilize um, really an army, for lack of a better word, of citizens uh, who are able to um, monitor the system but also help others understand um, when when there are claims of of misinformation individuals ordinary citizens can counter those claims by describing how the electoral system actually works um, and stephanie i don't know if you want to add anything in our last minute or two on this um yes just that a uh, uh the involvement of individual citizens is critical uh, to supporting democracy uh, as it works in the United States and not just with voting and and the the building a cadre of Americans who understand elections enough to explain things to the people in their networks social uh, you know uh, technologic you know social media networks or other networks. Um, that's in, incredibly powerful, and, um, and, and that's the motivation for this research. We want to figure out how to get more people more involved.